Yes, it's wonderful to be back in Hong Kong after a couple of years of hiatus. It's really great to feel the energy of Hong Kong. There is nothing like it, and it's just wonderful. So for me, at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and I'd like to also pay my respects to my colleague, Director of Development, John Richardson, over there. We're incredibly happy because we've just opened a new building, and that new building has caused us to think a lot about how we need to be a museum that is actually making conversations and has vision for the future. And that's why I particularly love the work of Rashid and why I said yes to be in conversations with, with Rashid, just because your work is so incredibly important at this point in time, but also I would argue you've been able to map the different points in time really carefully and well. So in preparation for this talk, it's been amazing to look at all the things that have been written about you. And there's so much, Rashid. Like, not only are you in every major collection in the States, but you've touched a nerve where people want to know what you have to say. And there's been some incredible articles written about how to, how to understand your work better, and particularly how to understand your trajectory because it's been so different. You're an artist that works across so many different mediums, and not everyone can do that with such mastery. So today we'll talk a little bit about that, but I thought we would kick off the conversation to talk about anxious men. You know, a lot of your titling has been about anxiety, or a lot of your work. The first series that you looked at with Anx called Anxious Men was in 2015, and you've constantly addressed global situations, also situations at home, to then go into the Broken series, which some of which are here in this show. And there's a beautiful quote that you gave to someone in talking about anxiety, and I'm just going to read it out and ask you to comment. But you said, uh, when, when people said, you know, why do you, why do you address anxiety, you said, I think anxiety is an opportunity to speak about the wholeness of concern, to think about fear, and that's really important today, and personalise these positions. So can you comment on that, please? That's a, that's a great quote. You don't, you don't remember saying it. I don't remember <laughs> saying that. I feel like, um, like Nina Simone, when, uh, when she's performing and she can hear the audience. Yeah. Um, speaking, she'd get really pissed off about it. You know, and I, I can kind of hear those people back there, and I'm like, "Shut the fuck up!" <laughs> or come into the room because we're doing this talk. Um, but it seems like it's quieting down, so it's good. Um, no, thank you. It's great to be here with you, Maud. Uh, it's great to be in Hong Kong. And I, uh, before I even start to unpack the question, I have to say for everyone who's here, who you know is from Hong Kong. It's really, really a prescient moment to be here, it mm. feels. Because uh, obviously the mask mandate uh, was removed, I think, maybe two weeks ago here. And I can feel just how recent the pandemic is here. And it's this incredible reminder of, uh, of all we've been through over the last few years and how complicated it was. And it's kind of brought me back to uh, how I was feeling even because I feel like in some ways New York and, and maybe some other places in the world had kind of started to claw our way forward a little bit earlier. And so being here is really this incredible reminder. So thank you for that reminder. And I knew it came at your expense, but uh, at the same time, it's a, it's a really incredibly valuable lesson for me. And I think that's a really um, easy entrance into talking about uh, my work and its relationship to, to anxiety. Mm. Uh, I was born an anxious person. Um, it's something that, you know, I may have inherited, um, I may have developed, I'm not sure, but it's always been not necessarily a handicap, but it's been um, present for me my whole life. It was something that my work had never uh, fully negotiated until about 2015, mm. and I realized that uh, the opportunity to make things up, oh, you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not usually that. No, I'm, I'm, I, I am usually that direct. Um, the opportunity to make things that were a reflection on my actual experience 
was um, as valuable as the opportunity to reflect on kind of critical concerns, historical or canonical concerns that were present in my work previous to that. So, you know, I, I went to the Art Institute of Chicago where I studied with a lot of kind of critical theorists, guys like Greg Bordowitz, uh, and, you know, a number of other really kind of brilliant professors. And, and what we really kind of learned in those spaces was to um, focus quite a bit on art history and canonical histories and critical histories and to find ways to reflect on that as artists. What they didn't ever teach you in those spaces, and I, I think art schools still suffer from this today, and I think we have some, some folks who, who work with art schools today, is how and, and how and in which ways your own personal experience can be a real kind of guiding principle and guiding opportunity to, to imagining what and how your work can be effective as a communicative tool. And so it took me many years to kind of um, find or to kind of refine what you often have as a child. You know, children will make a drawing and they'll say, why is the man, you know, in the left small? It's like, he's sad, mm -hmm. right? Like, they, they inherently are able to kind of create iconographies, create um, mm -hmm. directing principles for the work that speak not only to their kind of critical positions, but to their actual understanding mm -hmm. and circumstances, and to employ art and artwork in some respect as a cathartic tool. And so once I kind of came out of some of the haze uh, of my overeducation, I was able to start thinking about how I can use my work as a tool to reflect both my actual circumstances mm -hmm. and my actual feelings and to kind of use it to cathartically kind of find um, you know, a, a place for my work to, to, to be active in my own healing and what I realized later to be an opportunity for my work to be an effective tool in thinking about our kind of collective engagement with certain with certain themes, and I'm just going to expand on that. You go for it. Uh, you're, so, you, I'm, you're such a beautiful speaker. You all need me no, just sorry, to guide I'm, one. I'm front, okay. yeah. <laughs> go but, for it. Um, when I first started thinking about anxiety in my work, it was really coming out of a space where there were several different things that kind of brought me to a breaking point. One was being uh, a young father of a little boy mm -hmm. and thinking, how was I going to teach this person um, how to navigate the world? Like, I hadn't realized the calluses that I'd built up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my ability to tolerate things that are deeply problematic that, mm -hmm. you know, we all have. Where we're like, oh, yeah, you know, that's not such a big deal. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we come down on a younger generation, we're like, why are they so upset about this thing that's mm. obviously a problem, but we've all learned to tolerate, right? Mm. Like, we've all built these calluses. Mm. And so one thing that you realize when you become a father, or a mother, um, or a caregiver, is that you're responsible to tell someone else that they either have to build these calluses towards these things or um, reflect their own intolerance mm. of that thing. And I think that that triggered an anxiety in me that was pretty ferocious. Mm. Um, mix that with uh, Donald Trump coming, you know, up an escalator, down an escalator. I don't know where that asshole came. It was up or down. Um, and, you know, the kind of context and the potential for, for uh, a character who was as kind of uh, uh, difficult to, to understand as, as he was, also, you know, um, you know, in, in, in America, the kind of um, violent, the gun violence that, you know, we were experiencing and kind of considering that. On a personal note, I was quitting drinking. I was getting sober. So all of you who are, like, taking the edge off with a glass of champagne right now, I did not have that tool anymore. And so this kind of anxiety had really welled up in me as a result. And so I started making these works that, that included uh, this material, black soap and wax, mm -hmm. and I was pouring it onto white tiles, and I was kind of addressing it quite quickly with uh, like a stick and my finger and other tools. And I was, uh, I was um, kind of forced to negotiate like with, with pace because the material that I was using would dry. Mm -hmm. And then I would look at the people who work with me in my studio, Alex Ernest, who was with me, 
and, and I take I take a work home, show my wife, and they say, "Well, what is this?" And I was like, "This is this is it. this is my anxiety, <laughs> right? Like yeah. this is like an illustrative tool at mm. that point. Like here it mm. is." Uh, and then I showed that work in 2015, mm. and it was it was really interesting to me that I showed them, and they were these single portraits, and I imagined them as more or less uh, self portraits, and people were coming up to me throughout the exhibition and after and say, God, that, that's me. And I'm like, you got that so wrong because that's me, <laughs> you know? Like, how do you not realize that's mm. a self-portrait? But what it really did force me to negotiate is that we were dealing with this kind of collective mm. anxiety. And I never attempted as an artist to think about how to produce a zeitgeist mm. character, our figure, our theme. But we were living in this moment of such mm. extreme anxiety and I think that it was again perpetuated. I made these in 2015 to start and then it graduates out and I feel like we're living in like the age of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm on Lexapro, you guys should be too. But you know, we need to figure out ways mm -hmm. to, to, to navigate that. So I'm gonna stop. No, look, I think it's really super interesting because if you, as, as Rashid is talking, if you're looking at the work behind you, think about that, think about how the figure appears on that canvas and what it's doing in terms of its repetition and how those ideas might be projected in or out or whether you are them or not or whether it's still Rashid. I think it's a, it's a great way as an entrance to your work, Rashid, and also as a way to think, as you're saying, in 2015, what has changed from 2015 to now? You're making broken men, you're doing a whole lot of things with masculinity, by the way, but that's another question further down the line if we get to it. I think it's, uh, it's wonderful that there are artists like you that attempt to look at the world because we need, we need that guidance. You talked on a couple of different things in responding to my question and one of them is the importance of family. You know, you, you talked even about your son and I know that your mother is a professor of, Amer of, African, uh, of African history and your father also comes, or your stepfather comes from Africa as well. It led, I imagine, to very interesting conversations at home around the dinner table. But I imagine it also led you to look at many different, um, I guess, many different critics that have been addressing colonialism and a whole lot of be things about being. And I know that you looked at, I love the story when you were looking at an author called Dubois, who wasn't well known you uncovered the work and you started thinking about the work and you even took the title Souls of Black Folks for one of your works, for one of your big installations, which is quite a big, strong installation with a big face at the top and, uh, and bringing in a lot of elements that you look at. And I wondered about the importance of books in general, the importance of looking critically as you have been doing throughout your practice at different writers, but also the physicality of books which appears in your work. So if you'd like to address those both conceptually and then physically, please. No, it's, a, it's actually really a great question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, as anyone who, you know, has spent significant time with that, an academic knows, you know, books and research and that kind of rigor is really central to their practice. And, and my mother, as a, as a historian, um, was no exception to that. And so the thing that was most interesting to me about books early on was their, their physicality because mm. my house was kind of filled, filled with yeah. them. And they kind of, they, they, um, they were everywhere. And, and, and you would look at them, some of them were newer and some of them were older mm. and they were really, really intimidating. Um, I remember coming across, and it's a story that I, that I tell sometimes, uh, the spine of a book uh, by a, a writer named Harold Cruz, and the title was written in, in bright red. It said, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. <laughs> and I was maybe nine, mm. and I thought to myself, am I gonna have to read this? <laughs> like, is this what I am supposed to know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, W.B. Du Bois, mm. uh, and in and, and a book that he wrote, uh, The Souls of Black Folks, mm. and so, kind of the, the early exposure to these things yeah. and then the, the discourse around my table, mm. including my stepfather who's Nigerian and my mother. Yes. And just this kind of, the, these kinds of expectations mm. for 
how effective these tools could be as delivery systems. And, mm -hmm. and I've used them kind of consistently in my work, both as, as, a, as a motivator, as a way to kind of find spaces to explore and, and themes and mm -hmm. things to explore, but also as um, objects to kind of create redundancies. So mm -hmm. sometimes in my sculptures, I'll take a book because, um, because I'm interested in it. And I will repeat it on the surface multiple times. You'll see a book living on a sculpture 15, 20, 30 times. And, and what I kind of consistently say about that is that these are not found objects, right? I'm not as invested in the idea of a found object. I, I think found objects are, 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 are fantastic. I, I love that the artist can be some sort of genius who walks into some space and finds something and it's miraculous and it teaches us all. That's not how I work. Um, I search for things. I look for things really, really specifically. And, and I try for my work to be uh, transparent mm -hmm. in a way that it gives agency and an opportunity to kind of deliver on themes. So I'll take a book and I'll say, here it is, all these times repeated. And through that repetition and, uh, and, and the employment of it as a mark making tool, like not unlike what you see mm -hmm. you know, here the, with these kind of redundancies, like the mm -hmm. idea that a mark kind of mm. continues to graduate, continues to be repeated, continues to be redundant, and you start to realize it's a meditation mm. on this thing, not just an occupation of this thing. It's uh, part and parcel with a process. So mm. for me, books, literary references are all part of my, my practice and the process of mm. my practice. And um, it's not as, as complicated as maybe I could try to make it seem. I just find things that I really, really think are interesting, interesting whether it's yeah. Toni Morrison mm. or Du Bois or, 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 you know, even some other literary references. Huckleberry Finn. Yeah, Huckleberry Finn. I, you know, I have this collection of books, and I guess it's kind of a thing that, that people collect. I'm new to it, so I'm, I'm quite naive, but of books that were owned by previous owners, mm. right? So I have Huckleberry Finn that was owned by the activist, writer, poet, playwright, Amiri Baraka, who owned it as a young man when his name was Leroy Jones. Mm -hmm. And so I love this idea that we think of Leroy Jones or Amiri Baraka, who's like quite a radical thinker, as this incredible black activist radical thinker. But what was he doing at 10 years old? He's signing really cryptically in the back of Huckleberry Finn, his name, right? And how we're all so informed by these kind of canonical positions that we don't necessarily expect for mm. certain people to be informed mm. by. So uh, as an American artist, as somebody who's, uh, who's you know, shown an, an interest in kind of canonical literature mm. from every aspect, it's not as if I've just sat around re reading Richard Wright and James Baldwin my whole life, right? Um, I read James Joyce, you know, I, I, read, I read Huckleberry Finn, I read Faulkner, you mm. know. So the things that inform my project sometimes are a, a much more kind of complicated web than people often give credit mm. to it. And, and we oftentimes try to find these kind of simple triggers and ways to discuss um, kind of an artist's critical practice using our exterior uh, 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 signifiers as the way to imagine what that artist is interested in. And I think nine times out of 10, that's a really, really failed principle, right? It's a really, really failed principle and it's a really problematic one because we all have so many kind of influences that, that, that go beyond mm -hmm. what the, the expectations are. And, it, you know, that's come up here several times. Mm -hmm. People say, what do you think this Asian audience is gonna think of your work. I'm like, they're gonna think the same shit that everybody else thinks about the work because I'm giving you all of the tools mm. to decode the work, mm. right? Audiences are, 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 are nimble mm. and deeply sophisticated. Yeah. And your location and a little bit of your history mm. is not going to be the only tool that mm. you use to understand what an artist is doing. And if that is your limitation, I feel horrible mm. for you. Right, I feel um, I feel really bad because I just think that uh, it's one unlikely and two a limit that you're producing for yourself. Mm.
I think, Rashid, you've said that before to other people, and it's a really, really nice thing to say, the idea that the audience and the people that are looking at your work are an intelligent audience, because all too often, even in museums, you, you get told, no, just write the most, to the most common denominator. It needs to be super simple. I don't think things need to, I mean, they need to be clear, but the simplicity doesn't need to be there. There has to be complexity in the work and that's what you show. So I'm really glad that you brought it up again because as you say, whatever the audience, you're giving the tools. And it's also, and I'd like to come to that now, it's also about mark making as you say and that recognition of mark making and in this part of the world, mark making has been important for a very long time. Abstraction has happened for a long time here, has been produced out of here through ink, through calligraphy, all of those things. So there is a beautiful reading that can be done to your work. It's not what I want to focus on though. I'd like to just take us to another reading of it. And it's the fact that you've been making films and that's extraordinary considering the physicality of the work that you're doing. So for, to go from something as physical as what you're doing with the mosaics or with the paintings where there's, a, I can imagine you quite gesturally and physically working across these big canvases, you've had to work with a lot of people to produce films. So you've done um, The Native Sun in 2019, The Hikers in 2020 and Black and Blue in 2021. They're quite recent, but you've been making films throughout, as I understood, throughout your practice. Can you talk a little bit, for me, when I look at these works, there's the seriality, that repetition that you talked about, is very aligned to film work in terms of how things are structured and progress even, whether it's animation or something else. Talk a little bit about that, how film, how film works with your practice. Yeah, and the film is, is um, really, in a lot of ways, it's at the center of my project. Mm. I, I, I'm an artist who, I always joke, suffers from the post-medium condition, meaning that I don't have any investment in medium specificity. I really love all approaches, and, and, and I'm willing to tackle any, yeah. any direct way to kind of um, allow my ideas to resonate mm. and to find, to find place. Film is, you know, it's something that I fell in love with when I was really quite young. Mm. And... I remember going to, we had this little video store by my house, it's called Video Adventure. We got a VHS player when I was seven or eight, and we rented, um, this, is, this is not the most sophisticated film, but it was with uh, Michael J. Fox, it was called Secret to My Success. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I like storytelling, yeah. you know? Yeah. I really like storytelling. Yeah. And then I saw Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, mm. and my mind was just blown. Yeah, um, it's a good one. My mind was just blown. And then the Hollywood Shuffle was like yeah. the third rental film. But either way, it's, it's, it's the opportunity to tell stories in these kind of short forms is something that I think mm. is just so unbelievable. And probably the most difficult thing that, mm. that I've ever done is mm. make a feature film. Yeah. And I, I guess one of the reasons that that was so challenging is that as an artist uh, who makes paintings and sculptures and what have you, more or less the entire negotiation is with your own ego mm -hmm. and everyone else is negotiating your ego. Someone says, why did you make this? And you tell them why you made it. And, yeah. You know, it's you are in a room making these constructions. You know, it's the shit of the artist, right? It's like everything kind of revolves around your own yeah. kind of ego and gazing. Film is a completely different vehicle mm -hmm. because everyone that you have to collaborate with has an ego, mm -hmm. right? So as, uh, as the director, you're in negotiation with the actors and we can all imagine that those folks have egos. Yeah. Um, you're collaborating with the cinematographer. That person has an ego all the way down to mm -hmm. the guy who does the sound for the film. So jokingly, I always say that artists are probably not the best people to be filmmakers, but curators would be fantastic filmmakers because they're really used to dealing with other people's ego. Uh, it's, it's really true. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny that way. But it's, it's a relief for me sometimes yeah. to be yeah. able to kind of walk away from my practice as a painter and as a sculptor mm. 
and to, to walk into this much more kind of collaborative space yeah. and be forced to navigate and negotiate kind of the concerns, mm. both critical and aesthetic and emotional, uh, the terms and concerns of, of other folks. And it's led to, you know, me uh, navigating my practice as an artist differently in yeah. a lot of ways, like kind of trying to make uh, sculptures at times that are occupied by others, kind of giving mm. space giving voice, like I've, I've been really lucky over the course of my project to have my voice amplified and mm. to be rewarded by cultural institutions and, 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 and uh, public and private collections and, mm. and have my voice kind of given space and agency. Yeah. And as an artist, like really, that's what you're really asking for, yeah. right? You're like, yeah. I just want agency. Mm. I just want to, to, to have my ideas reflected back to me mm. with, with, um, with a feeling that they matter, yeah. right? And so kind of working collaboratively in film and thinking about mm. the structure of it and the need to give away and the idea and opportunity for generosity in mm. it has like led me to think about what can I give away mm. in my work in, yeah. in different ways, right? Mm. Like where where should it live? Mm. I, you know, I had a real aversion to public art. I thought there was like a kind of sophomore kind of component to it. As a young artist, I thought, oh no, I want the work to be at MoMA, or with my friend Richard Armstrong at the Guggenheim, or you know, some of these mm. other institutions that um, are, are the kind of beacons for high art, you know, for highness, for sophistication. And in the last few years, I've had the opportunity to have my work in public space. Mm. And I'm like, so oh. this is where it all goes down. Yeah. This is where we are. Mm. This is where the people are. Mm. And it does not have to be a space that doesn't kind of reflect um, the rigor that an artwork mm. can, can produce. Mm. But it also doesn't, the artwork doesn't have to be the kind of central kind of thematic position in public space mm. either. You know, you're like, I'm going to get on the train and this thing is here. Like two things can be true at once that, you know, you, you have this opportunity to kind of reflect on something, but also kind of continue mm. with your own journey. Mm. And I really love that, um, that that has kind of come from, in some ways from my relationship to making films. It's kind of a, a weird rhizomic pathway to get to that. But I think so. Is it about the public, about reaching a wider public in a sense? It's funny because I don't feel that ambitious. Mm. Like, I don't feel like my goal is for a wider public. It's almost as if I'm searching just for someone that I'm not sure mm. who they are, right? Yeah. It's almost like looking for. An audience, there's a, there's a great film like Looking for Langston that, yeah, that Isaac is Julian made, but beautiful. kind of looking for an audience is not for me the search for um, a big, broad group of people, but it's the search for that person who's going to see it mm. and they're going to fall in love. Mm. Are they going to teach me something when they mm. tell me about it, when they've seen it? It's just that, it's like looking for love. Yeah. You know, it's like looking for someone. Mm. To, to love you and for you to, to love. Mm. And so it's less kind of the ambition of like more eyes mm. um, as much as it is just trying to find like Cinderella. Yeah, right? I, do, I do love how your practice does seem to oscillate between the private and the collective and just how you're talking about it is another expression of that, that you're not after more people, even though obviously you've got something to say though. So that or is also, you obviously do want more people to, to hear that because it, it's making a comment on things that are happening. I think too what's interesting about your film work is that it talks a lot about society and about things that have happened also throughout history. There's a wonderful line of yours in The Native Sun where I was think, reflecting on myself because it talks about white people being quite uncomfortable when they talk about black issues and being in this kind of really, should I say it, should I not say it, you know, you know the line. And I think it's, uh, that, that's why I was reflecting that the content in your films, if you were to know that content and then look at the work, you would have a very different reading of the work. But of course, most of us have probably not seen those films and they, the 
the people might then draw the link and go, oh, that's Rashid Johnson who did who the film I watched. I'm going to go and see his work. So, in a sense, you're able to have quite a separate quite a separate practice unless someone brings it together in an exhibition, for example. So that's quite interesting. Yeah, it feels the thing that I think links my project right now as a, as a whole, and it's something that I'm still kind of learning and unpacking mm. myself, is you know, I, I, I read a book. You guys should pick it up. It's a good one. Um, it's, a, it's a book by a, a young critical theorist named Kevin Quashi, and the book is called The Sovereignty of Quiet. And really, what the thesis was is that um, black life is very public, mm. right? It's like a public life, whereas mm. you can see a person and then you can kind of project their kind of public concern because you say, oh, well, your concerns are mm. um, a, B, and C. You're disenfranchised, you're disappointed, mm. you're angry, you're frustrated, etc. And so this idea that you're living in this very kind of public body, right? This like inherently activist body, right? Where it's like your activist position is inherently projected onto anyone who's mm. kind of consuming you visually comes at the expense of quiet, mm. right? Or of interiority. Now, the thing that we have right, that makes us human and that makes our lives really, really quite beautiful is the opportunity for interiority, right? Mm. The opportunity for autonomy, independent thinking, um, you know, outside of like the collective domain, mm. right? And so when you occupy a body that is inherently public, inherently activist, and inherently has a projected set of symptoms or concerns, then you lose the opportunity for quiet. And so, mm. you know, after kind of unpacking that and exploring it and realizing that it is inherently, you know, been an obstacle for, mm. for, for me and my life and my thinking, my work has really taken the intention of making space for quiet mm. and making space for interiority our inner dialogue, unmolested, unwitnessed, conscious, thoughtful, and present, right? Mm. And that doesn't mean, and, and Kwashi actually takes this on as well, there's a difference between quiet and silence, mm. right? I mean, all of us probably have an experience in our life where someone yelled at us and it was an unsuccessful lesson. And another experience where someone whispered to us mm. and it was an incredibly successful mm. lesson. So I really like this idea that like, one can find quiet, one can find interiority, mm. and those can be kind of reflective and conscious tools that you can employ to kind of deliver on something. And that mm. leads to um, a lot of what has been present in, in my practice, whether it's this exploration of anxiety, which is this kind of position of interiority, right? Mm. I'm not in any way um, trying to produce a didact that suggests that this anxiety is not available to you mm. because it is only a reflection on themes or concerns that are my own, mm. right? Um, with these, these seascape works, which I call mm. them, are boats, they're these, um, these kind of simple gestures. I, I think of these boats as like spaces for like one. That they're like spaces that one person would float and have this opportunity for interior thought, mm. for quiet. Um, and for, for, for engagement in their own kind of concerns or themes. So, mm. you know, it's just an interesting time to be, for me, it's an interesting time to be an artist. Yeah. And it's an interesting time for us to explore identity in ways that we traditionally mm. haven't, you mm. know, outside of the, the principle of teaching and with the opportunity to kind of create a stage mm. or a setting to which we can all kind of occupy. And this is not some kumbaya shit, mm. right? Like, I, I have empathy for, this is a hard one to say. <laughs> Go on, say it. <laughs> but I really, I really think that I realized in the last few years that I love you guys. And I didn't before. 
Like, I sincerely did not. But I think that I do, and I think that the answer for me is to, um, to, to, to work towards that as a center kind of concept and theme, mm. to be generous, to be present, to be mm. empathetic, and to use love as a motivating factor. Mm. And that may sound, I don't know, it, so, it probably sounds like it sounds, no, no, but it no. doesn't make it untrue. <laughs> yeah. Almost um, my questions are a little bit meaningless after a statement like that. I have to say I'm going to think a lot about that. And I, but I think that you're touching on something that is happening and that is that want for generosity and that want for something more than what we've been getting and that connection. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite incredible for you to say in front of a crowd a statement like that. And I think it's, uh, it's reflected in the work that you do, Rashid, that there's a, an absolute confidence in the work and that, yeah, I, I, I think we, we all need to, with the lens of what you've heard, I think we need to go and look around not only these paintings but downstairs as well at the mosaic work just to, to reflect on that because it's, um, it's quite profound. And I know that uh, I talked about museum making in Sydney, for example, and that was one of the words that we used the most, that idea of generosity. How, do you, how, do you, how are you generous as an institution? And you can only be generous as an institution because the artists are generous because they're the ones that that then reach out in very different ways so that everybody doesn't get bored at the same type of generosity. So thank you. I'm going to think about that a lot. <laughs> I am going to continue just a couple of questions, if I may, just, and I think that, that one of the things that, that would be important for people to know is um, there's quite a, a, a repetition also in some of the materials that you use, and you, you talk about them as tools. You've got your set of tools and you're going to be using them and you use them differently. And I think about, you know, I think about the wax. I think about some of the methodology. And I think also about the sheer, I think you, you say it differently, shea butter. Shea, shea butter. And you talked about actually applying shea butter on yourself and that then that appeared, I know, in a film. And then consequently it has appeared in many of your works. And so that materiality is both personal as well as something that can be found. You CDs, a whole lot of things appear in your work. Can you talk about how you find those objects and why objects, you know, when you look at these, this body of work, you can't imagine objects attached to it, yet your practice is very different when it's installations or even downstairs. So what's the role of those objects? Yeah, I just, I've always loved material and I love how signifiers function. Mm. And I love that when you look at a material, it has this kind of inherent identity and can be something that kind of delivers in unexpected ways. When I first started uh, making sculptures using shea butter, shea butter is uh, a West African product that comes from a nut. And I mm. uh, traveled to West Africa. My mother, again, is an African history professor. So I grew up in this Afrocentric home. Mm. And uh, Afrocentrism is a really kind of complicated position in America in that it is a space occupied by black Americans who more often than not have no real framework for their, uh, for their identities, like no ability to look beyond um, you know, a few generations to be able to kind of identify where and, 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 and how they came to be an origin story. So I would travel to, you know, I grew up in Chicago and I kind of look around as I was like walking down the street and they would often sell this product, mm. shea butter on the street, um, on stands. And they would also have black soap, which is something that I'd use and shoe sticks and all these different kind of African materials. And I remember thinking, well, if I use that, is that going to like help me understand my mm. African identity? Like, is that going mm. to give me the tools to kind of mm. be able to perform in that space mm. differently? And so that really was the launching for like how I started thinking about material, not only as a way to make marks and make gestures and to kind of produce language, yeah. but as a language in its own. In its own, And yeah. so it's always kind of um, carried on with me and it carries on with me to what's happening with these paintings, with mm. oil paint. 
I mean, there's just such a long and complicated and sordid history with oil paint, and my employment of it is not uh, without consideration of that long and complicated history. History. Because mm, you work, you actually work with paint, people that make paint, don't you? I yeah. do. I, make, I work with, with people who make paints. I make the paint myself. I think mm. a lot about viscosity, and I think a lot about... Uh, you know, opacity and how the paint performs mm. on the surface. I'm, it's hard to get into the kind of more granular stuff because we've already gotten into the more complicated and interesting stuff. Yeah. <laughs> sure, but, we can flip back but, to that yeah, if you like, because I love mean, the other stuff, but I it's thought all people, there. yeah, it's, it's, all there. it's all there. It is all there. And it's You're hard, right. you know, to talk about yeah. uh, bodies of work that, yeah. you know, I don't want to make assumptions about what we know about the project. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. Look, I, and I think, I mean, just perhaps as, a, as probably one of our last questions, it, it would be good to talk about if we can go back then to the more complex stuff, if you, can, if you can bear it. But there's a lot of work now that is in terms of the boats that looks at, um, for, for us in Australia in particular, it's very... Uh, it conjures a whole lot of things in terms of migration, in terms of refugees, in terms of an awful history of Australia that continues today of that kind of, I guess, systemic racism that, that we're still battling with. It also, for you, there's, uh, I, I guess, the idea of escapism. We talked about it, that, that has been a thread throughout your practice, and escapism is probably in that the one-person boat I guess you could say that. Is it a continuation of that project or is it something else? The idea that suddenly, and I think it's suddenly, it may not have been, these vessels have appeared when before we've had either abstraction or figuration within your work. Yeah, no, escapism is, <laughs> again, like a theme in my project mm. that's omnipresent. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, which is quite cold uh, for anybody who's been there. And my mother, again, was an academic. We didn't have uh, a, a ton of resources. And I'll kind of end with this because it's funny. But um, when, I was, when I was young, I remember other kids would go to Disney World. And we didn't have the money to go to Disney World. They would come back with these shirts, and they would have palm trees on them. And they'd say, like, I went to Disney World, mm -hmm. and I was just so fucking jealous. <laughs> you know, I was just so jealous. And I thought to myself, the key mm. to success was to escape wherever you were, mm. right? Mm. Um, to find a way yeah. out mm. of wherever you were. And so for me at that time, the answer was a palm tree. There was no question about it. <laughs> and Is that why they appear a lot in your work? They do, okay. for that reason. <laughs> the answer was inherently a palm tree. I figured if I could just get to one of those damn palm trees, um, everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what I realized as I got a little bit older, right, and I got to the palm tree, it didn't solve all of my problems. Yeah. And I looked at the people who lived where the palm trees were, and I was like, you guys have a hell of a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, escape and escapism mm. has become this kind of interesting psychological journey. Mm. And I oftentimes employ images that use vehicles or that think about distant landscapes mm. or think about something outside of what's familiar to me as a metaphor or a way to kind of imagine what mm. and how escape would, would function and mm. what it would mean. So it's a dangerous game to want to escape. It is a dangerous game. Because um, in the end, wherever you go, there you are. Mm. You know, I've got other questions, but I think we have to leave it at that. You've given us so, so many things to think about, unlike um, many other talks, Rashid. I think that rather than, than glossing over quite a lot of things and giving us a very general talk, you've been so generous, and I, I want to end it there because we must. And let's go and look at the work again. Let's think about all those things. And, uh, and thank you so much. It's really really, really wonderful for you to, to give us these gifts of thought and of practice. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.
That was fun. That was fun. Thank you.